just like to say thank you to Jenneth and Ian in particular, but anyone else at Schumacher who were involved in organizing these lectures. It's a real pleasure and honor uh, to speak again uh, with this really great group of people. So what I'm hoping this talk will do is really allow us to begin to frame where we are as a species when we look at these different events and hopefully to give us tools by which we can respond somewhat more coherently to the various escalating crises that we're experiencing right now. So that's the spirit in which um, I'm doing this talk. Okay. So the title of my talk is Global Phase Shift Towards the New Life Cycle for Human Civilization. But this kind of five point summary hopefully will anchor the kind of main points that I'm, the kind of main argument that I'm trying to get across. First of all, um, we're looking at this pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic. And what I think is missing from many of the discussions about this in the mainstream is the recognition that this is really a symptom of a deeper ecological crisis. It doesn't come out of the blue. It's been, it's related quite fundamentally to the structure of our societies as they are right now. That's the first main point I want us to take away from this conversation. The second point is that one of the reasons we're not having these discussions in the mainstream is that our societies are ill-equipped to really see these crises in their full spectrum. And that's partly because of the way our science and our thinking is organized. It's very fragmented. We do and think in silos. We lack tools to bridge those silos very often. And we're kind of still grappling and struggling with the sheer complexity of these crises. And so it's very much to do with the, the kind of frame of orientation that we currently have as individuals as, and as institutions and organizations. We don't see the crisis in its full spectrum. We see it in, in small minute parts generally. We don't see it holistically. The third point that I'm hoping comes across is that when we do begin to piece together the puzzle um, and you know, kind of see how these things and different, these different symptoms and different elements actually fit as part of a wider system and, and a set of systems and we can see it holistically, we begin to see that actually there's a lot of compelling evidence that industrial civilization has entered the last stage of its life cycle. And I'll be describing what I mean by that in further detail. But I do believe that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated this, this, this stage, accelerated this, this, uh, this last kind of stage of uh, moving through this last stage, last stage of the life cycle. Um, and there's lots of reasons that we can begin to, that allow us to see how that stage is going to lead to many other complications if we don't begin to, to apply the right tools to, to not only see the crisis, but to respond to it. The fourth point related to that, I've argued that COVID-19 is like a pin that bursts a bubble. It's a useful metaphor, which I think allows us to see this pandemic as something which is, which is a sign of the old system breaking down. But the important thing to understand, the really critical thing, is that when we, when we do apply systems thinking to these issues. We begin to see that there is not only a recognition of an old system breaking down, but also a recognition of vast new possibilities for quite radical, dramatic change, that a new system may well be emergent. And what it looks like is gonna really be up to us. And it's in a sense, we're now faced with this really pivotal kind of choice, whether we, take the next step in our kind of evolution as a species or, or regress to, uh, to, to a, you know, kind of go backwards in a way. And that choice is really up to us and we're going to see this playing out in the next few decades. So the first part of this talk, we're going to talk about understanding the current life cycle. In doing this, we're going to be talking about quite a wide range of things. I want to start with the concept of the Anthropocene, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's this idea that 
it, we've entered a new geological era. And this is certainly not a concept that's set in stone. It's hotly contested. There's a lot of disagreement about the idea. But the basis of the idea is that there's sufficient empirical evidence to conclude that if you look at human activities and our impact on the earth, we've indelibly impacted the geology of the earth. And there are lots of really clear markers of that. And this warrants us saying that we've actually entered a new geological epoch entirely distinct from previous ones. And there's an interesting argument about this, um, which I want to go through. And it leads us all the way back to the colonial era. And when we, when we take this slightly interdisciplinary or even or transdisciplinary view, where we bridge together the disciplines of historical analysis, critical race theory, um, you know, this concept, this geological concept, uh, ecological analysis, you know, understanding of climate change. We bring all these things together. We come up with a really quite insightful narrative that allows us to understand how we got to where we are. And one marker date that I've put up here on the slides is 1492, when Christopher Columbus first arrives in the United States. And you can see that this date around this period of time represents the dawn of a new, uh, a new era for, for, for human beings when, when European colonists began venturing out and exploring different parts of the world and um, we began this, this process of, of, of expansion. And one of the well-known things that happened in the ensuing centuries after Christopher Columbus arrived in America was that vast numbers of Native Americans died. And they did so largely due to what you might call a kind of a, a biological, ecological crisis where, where Europeans brought many new exotic diseases to a land which had never experienced these before. Um, and it led to the literal collapse of Native American civilizations over the, over the, over the decades that followed something like 50 million Native Americans are estimated to have died um, <clears throat> altogether around this time, over this long period of time. Um, and this is important to also recognize that even though the biological ec ecological dimension was crucial, there was also many other complicated social and political issues at play where we had colonists coming with different social relations. So for example, the Spanish, when they came, they wanted to um, absorb Native Americans into their own kind of um, economic enterprises and use Native Americans as a labor force. And this kind of accelerated the deaths. You know, these, these labor camps often became, became kind of death camps for Native Americans. When the British colonists came, they had a different approach because they found that the natives were not useful as a labor force. They found them to be a useless labor force. And we kind of reminded of that horrible phrase, useless eaters. And in many ways, um, the British, when they attempted to resolve different contestations with Native American communities and tribes, uh, as they were kind of taking over more and more areas of land, often these would erupt into violent confrontations when Native American communities didn't comply or there was a breakdown in, in, in various agreements that had been set in place. And this would lead to exterminatory campaigns by the British to extinguish uh, the Native Americans from the land. So we had these different forms of, of mass violence kind of playing out across uh, the, the continent and often happening in, 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 in competition between the different colonial powers as well. But one of the, the rebound effects that, that took place that many aren't aware of is, was flagged up by these two British geographers, Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin, in, in the journal Science a couple of years ago. And they noted quite extraordinarily that by 1610, if looking at the Atlantic ice cores today, they record that at that time, there was an unusual drop in atmospheric CO2. And this was because of the large vegetation regrowth that was taking place across the Americas on these on abandoned farmlands that happened because of the collapse of Native American civilizations that had, 
in the wake of colonization was quite extraordinary. And Lewis and Maslin, as a result of this analysis, conclude that they have, we have strong grounds to really situate the beginning of the Anthropocene at 1610, where we can see this indelible impact on the earth with the wiping out of, of a whole, civilized, whole series of civilizations and the impact of that on the climate. And of course, what they point out is that going forward, colonization continued to have quite an extraordinary impact on the world system and eventually paved the way for industrialization. And one of the, we one of the mechanisms through which that happened was the emergence of transatlantic slavery. And in 1619, just, to, just nine years after we see this drop in atmospheric CO2, a British ship arrives in Virginia carrying 20 African slaves. And this is recognized largely as the beginning of a centuries long, extraordinary, horrifying period of, of enslavement, but which however played a very critical role in the emergence of the world system as we know it today. So some more important dates to keep in mind. By the 19th century, um, we see that again, this process of transatlantic slavery was involved in what you might call, you know, it was a form of structural genocide, you might say. Up to 65 million Africans were killed in this slave trade. I mean, the estimates vary. That's an upper estimate by R.J. Rummel, um, but it's very, very plausible. And along the way, as this process of violence was playing out, industrialization took place, as we know, sometime around the 17, mid-1700s. Um, the Industrial Revolution began. And we now know, according to historians like Robin Blackburn, for example, that the transatlantic slave trade played a really, really crucial role in galvanizing the Industrial Revolution. And he estimates that something like 20 to 55 percent of the fixed gross capital formation in the UK, where the Industrial Revolution began in 1770, basically came from the slave trade. And even though all of that wasn't invested, it did support massive reinvestments in manufacturing, shipbuilding, canals, and coal mining. Um, about a century on, 1860, we had the first uh, oil, oil reserves opened up. And this was the beginning of the oil age. Industrialization then ushered in this new era of fossil fuels. And at the same time, what we must have to remember is that there is clearly this nexus then. You know, we had this nexus between the, the emerging age of fossil fuels, emerging out of this period of empire, as well as this new era of scientific racism that was associated with colonial practices, including slavery. And of course, scientific racism um, was a kind of, uh, you know, it was, it was built, a, a kind of distorted and, and, and adapted some of the basic ideas of, of, of Darwinism, uh, neo-Darwinism, and applied it in a social context and tried to justify this idea of a hierarchy of superiority in the world with, with Europeans kind of at the top and other races uh, lower down the ranks. And all of this was part of the global capitalist system as it emerged. And ironically, as the structures of global capitalism became more solidified and there is a huge debate about why slavery finally ended but I think there's a strong case to be made that the, the production structures of capitalism you know the wage labor and the efficiency processes pl played a role in kind of creating the pressures that made the, the the older systems of slavery just seem not so useful anymore they were less than profitable often even at the time um, and now I think with the pressures of global capitalism emerging, they became even, even less useful and less profitable. And the perception that, the, that there was actually a, 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 a benefit in getting rid of these certainly was spurred onwards, as well as maybe cultural shifts and other kinds of uh, moral struggles and so on and so forth playing a role. But I think, you know, all of these things played a role. Um, but as a result of that, you know, the world system changed in many different ways. It, but rather than racism simply disappearing, racism became institutionalized in new forms, embedded 
in our political, economic, health, social, and other structures, uh, in some ways became much more invisible. One of the uh, um, facts that I learned during the recent Black Lives Matter protests that really shocked me to the bone was that um, the number of black people incarcerated in uh, American prisons um, is, is um, apparently f even larger than the number of slaves uh, uh, in, you know, if you go back centuries at any single time. Something like that, I remember reading this absolutely crushing statistic a couple of weeks ago and that really hit home to me how um you know racism rather than disappearing is simply transformed and metamorphosed in ways that are, are difficult to detect now what we saw with the with that with that narrative that i've put forward there is the beginning of what i would say the beginning of the current life cycle of industrial civilization and we now find ourselves on the cusp of that and one way of seeing it is seeing it as an endless growth machine. And many of the dynamics that we've seen uh, kind of that were developing during that period in the colonial era and during industrialization in the 18th to 19th century have now become much more sophisticated and cemented in different ways under the mantle of globalization. And what I'm going to do is run through some statistics and some graphs really quickly to, so that we can get a sense of this extraordinary endless growth paradigm and how it's developed. Uh, and now we can see that this graph of world energy consumption shows from the 1800s all the way to 2000, this uh, exponential growth, which really began to took off after around 1940, 1950, after the Second World War, where we can see the kind of the heyday of globalization accelerating all the way. And we see this correlated with many other trends, world GDP growth, has experienced exponential growth. Global carbon emissions, of course, have experienced exponential growth, directly related, of course, to our, our chronic dependence on fossil fuels. And what's also really interesting and important to remember is that even though there is a macro correlation uh, with, it, with uh, world population growth and uh, all of these other factors, it's important to break it down to understand that actually what's really driving this is not so much just population growth per se, but when we look deeper into the different dynamics of different populations, it's really consumption. Um, so what we find, what this little graph shows us here, is that it's the higher income uh, percentage of the world that is really driving this. Um, and this is hit home in, in a recent study um, that was published in, in Nature Sustainability by a colleague of mine, um, Julia Steinberger, uh, and several other uh, experts uh, who co-wrote the piece with her, that something like um, the top 10% of the world's richest people are responsible for uh, up to 43% of, of, of global environmental impacts. So that kind of fact really hits home that ver it's very much about consumption and inequality. That's not to downplay the role of population, uh, or, to, or to neglect it, but to, to recognize the complexities in that. So all we can see with these uh, different trends, exponential growth trends, is that when we situate them in the context of the Earth, we seem to be definitely breaching planetary boundaries. As you can hear, I think you can probably hear my son in the background, and he's, he's currently breaching um, uh, the boundaries of my, my ears. <laughs> I hope he's not too disturbing him in the background running around. Um, but he's, he's found lockdown really difficult. So, as you can see, this is a, a well-known uh, diagram produced by um, people like luminaries like Will Stefan and, 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 and Rockstrom and, all the, and other climate scientists who try to kind of really map out what are these, what are these boundaries in the, on the planet that we appear to be uh, uh, breaching in this way through exponential growth. Um, this is a really important framework to remind ourselves of when we're going through this because it reminds us that the, 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 this, this, this idea that of the safe operating space for human civilization, it reminds us that the way in which we are living is very much dependent on the stability and integrity of this very complex planet system. 
of, of planetary ecosystems, which consists of all of these different things that have been mentioned here, such as biosphere integrity, land system change, and so on and so forth. And as the diagram suggests, we're already at the point of reaching danger zones, high-risk danger zones, where we may be breaching these boundaries. Here's another way of looking at this is the, uh, the global footprint analysis, where, which suggests that at our current rate of use consumption of resources, we're consuming the equivalent of one and a half to two planets. And as we can see, this happened around 1970s when we kind of really began to overshoot. And that's an important date to keep in mind as we go along. The 1970 seems to have been an inflection point in many other areas. As we can see here, climate change, one of the most biggest impacts is the acidification of the ocean. And what this means is that as the ability of the oceans to absorb carbon dioxide is reducing due to the increased uh, uh, global, uh, global emissions, it's having all these unpredictable impacts on the marine marine life and some of the projections are really astonishing and they suggest that not only have we already potentially killed something like 50 percent of the great barrier reef if we continue at this level by the, before the end of century we will have you know the great barrier reef is literally at, at risk of, of of dying out and it's one of the largest living organisms on the planet which tells us exactly how devastating things are Another way of seeing the climate crisis is through heat wave epidemics. And again, from 1970 onwards, we can see an exponential rate in the, in the number of heat wave events around the world. This is also correlated with an increasing frequency in natural disasters. Again, from 1970 onwards, we see this inflection point. So we see this correlation between the date in which we seem to have overshot resources on the earth in terms of resource consumption and then seeing these correlates with other earth system crises again from 1970s onwards we're looking at an increased frequency in extreme weather events whether it's drought extreme temperature floods wildfires and so on and so forth so we can really see that something is is, is happening at the same time within our existing economic system we can see there are also this, this massive inertia, this huge problem. We keep being told that the way in which we're doing things at the moment is the only way to, to deal with poverty and so on and so forth. But what we're really seeing when we look at this kind of data here is actually the number of people who have stayed at a certain level of wealth. So, so here we have the middle, if you see that blue line, the middle 40% global middle class, in fact, th their, their wealth has kind of really fluctuated. It's not really improved very much. And the projections indicate that it's pretty much going to stay the same, if not level off and decrease. Whereas the top 1% of people, their wealth has been increasing over time. And that's obviously been the case for the 0.1% and the 0.01%. And this speaks to the reality that structural inequalities and poverty within this system haven't really changed, haven't really improved. Of course, if you narrow down the focus, maybe look at very specific uh, issues, measures such as life expectancy or infant mortality, there've been some welcome improvements in, in some areas. But overall, we have to really question how sustainable this model is, given that when you take a much wider lens, looking at the number of people who live on $5 a day, for example, rather than the World Bank's measure, of poverty which is less about 1.25 dollars a day looking at slightly more realistic figures actually the number of people in poverty is literally half the population of the planet and it's pretty much stayed like that um, for decades so we're not really solving any of these problems and again this graph demonstrates the levels of global inequality that we're seeing rising even within the heartlands of the world system the united states germany france uk the, the Europe overall, we've seen that in, in these areas, which we've been kind of been the heartlands of, of, of capitalism as we understand it, inequality has been rising exponentially. Now, there's another really interesting uh, correlate with all of this. And as we go along, once we get towards the end of this kind of going through the DOFs and the data, 
we'll begin to talk more about the frameworks by which we can make sense of all this. But this is an important uh, concept that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the idea of net energy or EROI, energy return on investment. Um, I think the pioneer of this, uh, Professor uh, Charles, Charles Hall, um, basically created this really interesting ratio. Well, I'm not sure if he actually created it, but he certainly did most advance advance it in, in, in applying it to an understanding economies and energies and the interplay with society, I think. And he basically, you know, showed how it's a simple measure of how much energy you put in to get a, an amount of energy out. Um, so obviously, for that to work really well, you want a very high EROI. You want it to be um, as high as possible so that your ratio means that it's very efficient. You put a little bit of energy in, you're getting loads of energy out. And that was how it was at the beginning of the fossil fuel heyday. Um, we were looking at levels like um, almost like 100 to 1, something like that, um, when, when they found the first, uh, made the big oil and gas discoveries in the United States, for example. Um, but since then, uh, the situation has changed dramatically. And this graph uh, from a study put out by a couple of years ago um, by um, economists Victor Court and uh, Florian Fizain. And what they found is they wanted to kind of understand what's the global net energy situation. If you look at all of the main fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal, and they concluded that pretty much global EROI peaked around the 1960s. And since then has undergone a gradual decline and an inexorable decline, and it's continued to go down. Um, we can discuss some of that data as we go forward and what that means. But it certainly correlates, as you can see, with some of the other crises that we faced, you know, the exponential uh, overshoot from 1970 onwards, uh, the exponential rates of disruption we've seen in the climate system, all happening at the same time as we're seeing a decrease in global EROI. And at the same time that that's been happening, um, again from the 1970s, we've noticed that there is this decline in the rate of GDP growth. This is a phenomenon called secular stagnation. And this is happening globally around the world, um, but you can also see it quite visibly in the most industrialized economies. So the United States, Europe, and Japan, we've seen that the rate of GDP growth has absolutely declined um, from the 1970s onwards until today. And this is happening for several reasons. The role of net energy is definitely one important one that is often not factored into account. But there are also other reasons to do with technology, uh, returns from technology investment, labor productivity, and other issues. But all of these, I think, uh, people like Tim Jackson um, from uh, the University of Surrey would probably argue that these things are quite complexly interlinked. And what it's, what, what it's kind of culminating in as we've moved into this stage from, you know, we ended up with the 2008 financial crash. And since then we've had the kind of, you know, we keep being promised that there is, there is a kind of an economic recovery, but what we've really seen is there's not really been a fundamental return to growth. In fact, growth appears to have plateaued and it's very much correlated with um, the kind of done with, with oil and energy production and GDP. We see this, very clear correlation over the last few decades. So this idea that we've moved into this, we're beginning to move into this new stage of diminishing returns. And we kind of entered this inflection point in 1970, and it's had all sorts of ramifying consequences on our global system is beginning to become quite clear. But the question of course that might come to mind is how have we kept the machine going with all of these difficult issues? And I think that one of the main things that we've done is we've, we've basically accelerated debt. And this, this graph here gives an indication of how we've excessively relied on uh, kind of new ingenious methods of creating debt in order to, to keep our economies moving. Um, and we can see again that this inflection point really took off around 1974, 1978, as we moved into the 1980s, we see this kind of, it begins to become exponential. And one of the thing, reasons that is, I think, is two things happened around this time. The first thing that happened is, in order to deal with this, these, these challenges and problems that the, that the system was facing, 
um, there was an outsourcing of manufacturing, of course, uh, to, um, to other countries where they could find cheap labor uh, with less kind of human rights standards and all the rest of it. And that allowed um, them to kind of lower the costs of production and accelerate profits. And the other thing that happened, which really compounded this, was the introduction of new ingenious instruments of credit. So in other words, you don't really need to, need to even rely on production to make money. You just need to make more debt. You lend people money, lend it into existence, and then they have to basically pay you back. And that's uh, uh, because you're asking them to pay you back on interest, you're going to make your profits in that way. And so you're incentivized to lend more and more and more in order to get, get paid back more and more and more. And this has led to this kind of cycle of an accelerating debt bubble. And as you can see from this graph, even after the global financial crash in 2008, rather than seeing an amelioration of this, we've actually seen an exponential acceleration of, of the expansion of debt through mechanisms like quantitative easing and so on and so forth. And that, of course, has led us up to the, continued up to the point when we had the uh, global pandemic. Um, now, what I wanted to do is kind of give you a narrative of how this kind of slightly more concrete narrative of how these different trends when you're looking at them like that in isolation it can be quite overwhelming it can be quite abstract difficult to kind of make sense of it sometimes but what i wanted to do is kind of give you a narrative of how i think some of these trends are playing out quite concretely so we're going to start with um remembering the context of the 2008 financial crash Going back a little bit, the context of that being uh, the 2005 peak in conventional oil production, uh, which kind of elicited this shift to more expensive unconventional forms of oil and gas, especially the shale gas bubble and all the rest of it. Um, what happened in that period, if we remember, we remember the rocketing uh, oil prices on the world market, um, we remember lots of other things taking place that fed into food prices and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the things that happened in that whole process from um, 2007 to 2010, um, as we lead up to the Arab Spring, well, there were these series of climate events at the same time, which as you might remember, there were these, uh, there's a sequence of droughts that took place uh, in all the major food basket regions around the world. Um, I think, you know, India, South America, um, I think every single food basket region was affected. And it led to this unprecedented uh, crisis of scarcity in, in, in production, which further inflamed the food prices um, globally. And so we had all of this stuff happening on a global level. And what was quite interesting is that this had very specific regional impacts. And in the Middle East, one of those impacts from food prices was quite devastating. So the food prices obviously impacted countries like, um, you know, Algeria, Egypt, um, you know, Tunisia, where, where all, you know, where we saw these major kind of eruptions of, food, of riots. There's been many studies which described these as actually food riots because people couldn't afford the price of bread. Uh, and most of these countries were heavily dependent on food imports by, by this point in their in their in their life cycles as a result that meant that when the prices went up on the world market this really had a devastating impact domestically but those were also compounded by these other things that were happening within these countries so in countries like syria for example there was this ongoing trend line of its own domestic resources depleting and this is something that is often very rarely discussed and it was compounded by domestic ecological crises as well. So Syria is a really great um, kind of example of this to understand how devastating these dynamics were because in 1996, Syria's oil production peaked. So Syria transitioned from being uh, a, an exporter of oil um, and you know, which kind of all its revenues were heavily dependent on this. And it kind of went, uh, its revenues began to decline uh, ever since the peak in uh, decades ago and began to gradually decline. And eventually, as we get closer and closer to the Arab Spring period, we see that Syria's state revenues almost began to hemorrhage. 
And so Syria responded by slashing domestic oil and gas subsidies, domestic food subsidies. So this, of course, massively compounded the problems that people were experiencing. At the same time, Syria was also experiencing an exacerbated drought cycle. And, the, and climate change had, had uh, amplified the impact of the drought cycle. It had led um, farmers in the south of Syria to migrate because agriculture had collapsed. Um, it was compounded by many other issues like water management issues and, and you know, political corruption and so on and so forth. And what happened is you had these predominantly Sunni farmers in the south migrating into these coastal cities largely dominated by the Alawite clan, which is obviously the ruling clan affiliated with Bashar al-Assad in Syria. So we had these simmering ethnic tensions kind of boiling up as we get closer to this kind of 2010, 2011 point when the Arab Spring kicked off. And these same processes were also playing off in different ways in other countries. So Yemen, for example, had also experienced a collapse of its oil system. Egypt had, had also experienced a, a peak in conventional oil production around the same time. Um, so many of these things were playing out in similar ways. But in Syria, of course, one of the things that happened is that because of Syria's geopolitical and geostrategic uh, kind of positioning in relation to all sorts of things, but certainly it had a lot of interest from world powers, uh, world powers, United States, Russia, all very interested in Syria for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so they began to uh, take sides during this conflict as, as kind of a conflict began to brew. And clearly what happened is, you know, people came out on the streets in Syria, they um, protested, Bashar al-Assad responded um, by cracking down uh, and essentially killing people in the streets. And eventually the uh, uprising uh, began to take up arms. And before we know it, we had a, a horrifying civil war situation. And it was exacerbated even further when the United States and Russia and other powers, uh, all of them kind of poured in with support to their favored sides. And as a consequence, we saw this, uh, what, what started off as an earth system crisis that was radicalizing political and economic challenges erupted into a, a protracted geopolitical conflict that we're still living with today. And it's within that crucible of, 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 of that intersection of crises that ISIS was, of course, uh, emerged from this. And extremism uh, kind of, beca kind of came, become, became this very powerful force and in itself created a, a further cycle of, of, of radicalization. Now, I've referred to a number of things here like HSD, and that's because um, <laughs> ESD and HSD. And we're going to come back to those uh, in a couple of minutes. But that was only the beginning of the really complicated system dynamics that began to emerge because once that took place in Syria, it had all of these regional, again, ramifying implications across the region. And to narrow down our focus so we can make sense of the simple point I'm trying to make is that those things then, in a way, had this flip effect on the wider world system and it had a direct impact on the politics of Europe and the United States, leading us to the point where we are today. And what we saw happening is, in the wake of the Syria crisis, um, we had the massive influx of refugees from the region. Half of them were from Syria, but up to a million people turned up on the shores of Europe in, over a very short period of time, trying to escape conflict. And this, of course, was exploited by various factions, political factions in the United States and in Europe and in the UK. Um, and we had all sorts of other complex factors involved, you know, dark money, electoral manipulation, nationalist propaganda, and so on and so forth. But all of that created this astonishing vortex um, of, of uh, political acceleration, which resulted in something that m I think not many people predicted at all, which was the Brexit victory and the victory of, of Donald Trump. So two of those things, highly unpredictable, uh, but now in hindsight, we can begin to see how these other big dynamics on the world stage played a role in, in setting the stage for these things to become more, far more possible than they would have been without them. <clears throat> so with all of that 
as the backdrop, we now find ourselves in 2020 in the midst of a devastating pandemic. And as of a couple of days ago, where do we find ourselves? We have more than half a million deaths around the world, something like 12 million infections still ongoing. <clears throat> We've faced plummeting GDP. Uh, and even though basically there are many countries that have successfully suppressed the virus, there are many countries, unfortunately, which have failed to suppress the virus. The UK and the US are outstanding examples. Um, there's an ongoing risk of an epidemic resurgence, even after suppression because of the kind of mismanagement of the public health crisis. And of course, the biggest warning of all coming from the United Nations Environment Programme just a couple of days ago as well, that in many ways, this is kind of a dry run for the next pandemic. We're, we're, this is, dealing with this is really just the beginning. We're not out of the woods at all, even if we manage to sort this out. And to quote from the report, further outbreaks will emerge unless governments take active measures to prevent other zoonotic diseases, uh, diseases which um, move amongst the animal populations from crossing into the human population. And identified drivers, which we can see are very, very closely linked to the, the in, in integral structures of industrial civilization, increased urbanization, rapid expansion of cities, industrialized agriculture, unprecedented levels of climate change, and the loss of biodiversity, environmental damage, how all of these are, of course, essentially industrial civilization, encroaching further and further onto our natural ecosystems and devastating the biodiversity, devastating the, the landscape, devastating and, and, and impacting land and wildlife, and increasing the proximity of human settlements with um, these zoonotic diseases that now have much greater opportunity to jump to human beings. So this now allows us to kind of um, take a bit of a step back to see, if we look to all of these crises, where, what does this mean when we look at the pandemic? How do we understand the pandemic? Well, I think it's clear that the pandemic is kind of like the late, it's like another version of the 2008 financial crash. It's part, you know, call it the pin that burst the bubble. But it was also a pin created by that same bubble. So in a way it burst itself. It originated due to industrial expansion. And all the evidence is telling us that future pandemics remain inevitable in a business as usual scenario. The other major impact is it has done a similar thing to what other crises has done. It slumped economic demand. And we've had semi-permanent lockdowns have crashed GDP. But what's also clear is that even if we didn't have lockdowns, all of the studies and modelings that have been done by economists to look at what would happen if you just let it run through your population? The impact on healthcare systems, uh, the overwhelming impact of the sudden death rates and so on and so forth would be devastating for economies. And what's interesting really is if you look at the modeling of what would happen if you don't do anything and you're looking at the massive chunks of GDP that would be taken out and you're looking at the massive chunks of GDP that have been taken out and will be taken out in the wake of these permanent kind of or semi-permanent lockdowns or series of different lockdowns or social distancing whatever is going on that we're trying to deal with it we've moved into this new era of, of slow growth and it's very difficult to see how GDP could ever return to normal and there's also been these other ramifying impacts the financial crash has decimated the US shale sector already there's a question mark as to whether that's going to be permanent or not but one of the interesting things that's happened is because of the massive slump in demand which could well be semi-permanent because many are suggesting that transport will never really return to the way it was with, with people commuting who previously commuted wanting to stay at home for example uh, you know even big businesses and ceos saying that they don't see the point anymore in investing in huge office spaces and traveling around the world and and is it really necessary lots of it's, there's, there's, a, there's a big shift in the thinking that's gone on and it suggests that there is going to be a huge issue of demand might never come back for the oil industry and where does that leave the industry it means that reserves may be permanently shut um, and so on and so forth and that would exacerbate all sorts of other issues what happens with all the other complicated dynamics then when we see how these would feed back well the energy system and the changes in that and the transport sector and all of these things in the health sector and the crashing GDP, all of these could have 
massive effects on food systems and manufacturing systems overall. And we've already seen how these have played out. But one of the most interesting ones that I, I read about during the pandemic, which you're probably familiar with, is um, the one about dairy and how because of the massive uh, reduction in demand for dairy, because people aren't going to cafes and they aren't ordering as many lattes and all the rest of it, is we're seeing that <clears throat> cows have been had to wean off. They've kind of been they've been taken aside. There's no because they 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 <clears throat> it's, there's there's system in place which requires all of these cows to be milked at these crazy levels to meet demand, and suddenly they're not needed anymore. And when they're not needed anymore, they just go dry, and then you can't bring those cows back on the market again and keep them we kind of start weaning them again when you need them to. So we've moved into this phase where while there may be a supply crunch for dairy uh, in, in coming months, and uh, if not by next year, something like that. And again, that's happening in many different areas, even with kind of like um, strawberry picking and so on and so forth. We're seeing those kind of things. Unfortunately, <clears throat> we've had this business as usual approach still. You know, we look at countries like the United States and the UK, and I think the dominant approach is to buckle down and double down on the neoliberal market oriented approach. But this, of course, is only going to exacerbate systemic vulnerabilities because it will lead to more of the same structures and processes that led us into this process already. And what's really alarming about it, and I think the Black Lives Matter process have underscored this, is that if we don't address it and don't begin to reevaluate all of these systemically, we face the reality that there is going to be a heightened risk of civil unrest and political destabilization in many different ways. Um, and we've seen this in the past with the Occupy movement. We, after the 2008 financial crash, we saw it with the Arab Spring. Um, and we've seen it again with Black Lives Matter. And I think what we begin, again, what, we, what we're starting to be able to see using this kind of slightly bigger picture analysis is that every time we've had a big, large kind of outbreak of civil unrest, it's in the context of this wider disruption that really has roots in the disruption of the earth system it's not just an economic crisis or it's not just a political crisis it's fundamentally being driven by these earth system dynamics that we, we continually ignore and where does this where does this all head where does this all leave us if we continue on business as usual a couple of years ago when i was uh, doing research at anglia ruskin university i had the fortune of um, seeing uh, a model that Alad Jones and his team were developing. Um, <clears throat> and their model was presented at this uh, event. And I remember Alad was discussing it, he presented it and described it. Um, and, you know, we had different people in the room, including people from the foreign office who had actually funded the model. And this, I think this is probably one of the first models that's been kind of had that semi-official kind of support from a government. And extraordinarily, he said that, look, the model, if you run it forward, um, and he said he cautioned and he said we shouldn't really run the model forward because um, it doesn't take into account feedback loops from behavioral change but if you do run it forward this is what happens and he said by 2040 essentially all of these trends that we've seen preceding the Arab Spring this intersection of climate uh, energy water crises and so on and so forth they they accelerate in different ways and by 2040 we have this escalation of, of food riots across these critical regions and he says civilization essentially collapses uh, in, in, the, in, in, in this kind of uh, horrifying dystopian scenario of civil unrest and after laying all of that out thankfully he said he doesn't believe that this scenario is actually plausible because there are lots of things already happening even um, during the creation of this model which suggests that th there's lots of mitigating frameworks in place We've gone through a bit of a narrative journey there. Um, we've, we've kind of run through a lot of data um, and we've explored um, some of the really big major events and we've begun to develop a framework to see how these things are really kind of the blips in a system that is beginning to fail. And what I'd like to do now is run through some of the systems frameworks that I find really useful to make sense of this. Some of it, one or two things are stuff that I've developed most of it is stuff that other uh, experts have developed. 
Um, but I think a combination of these frameworks are really powerful to, to understand where we are. So the first thing to understand is, let's, you know, they will go through the basics just to kind of run through them. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but it helps us when we start going into slightly more complicated stuff. So obviously a complex adaptive system, how does it work? Pretty simple, really. You've got lots of different parts which are interacting individually. And what happens is this structure emerges from it. And what do we mean by that? It means that basically when, uh, the way in which different parts in the system interact creates a certain dynamic. Um, and what emerges from that are a kind of a, a set of patterns. And those patterns, you could describe them as rules or norms or behavioral, you know, this kind of overarching behavioral norms and rules, which then begin to constrain and enable how the parts in the system actually operate. So it's this kind of dynamic interactive process where we can begin to see that. And one of, one of the um, really simple analogies I always use is the idea, which is it's not actually a complex adaptive system, but I always use it because it's easy to understand is the idea of water. If you imagine uh, the water molecule made up of oxygen and hydrogen, and you put these configurations together in the right way, and then eventually you get, and then out of those, those things which separately are gases, you put them together and you get water. And that emergent structure of water is this liquid, which of course enables new types of behavior of the parts and also constrains it in different ways. And it does that in a way which is not detectable at the level of the parts by themselves. You have to come out and have a look at it overall and look at the whole to see that dynamic relationship. So I find that a useful analogy. So that's what we have a complex adaptive system. The other critical, critical kind of concept I want us to really bear in mind as we're going forward is this idea of intelligence, because we're going to come back to this as a kind of a winning solution. Um, but intelligence in a complex adaptive system, of course, this is really important when we're understanding living organisms or social systems. And here we have a diagram which really kind of actually tells us the same thing. You've got the same, you've got the simple self-organized local relationships, so there's the individual parts. Uh, and we've got the complex adaptive behavior here, which is the emerging structure. And we have these uh, feedbacks between that. But what's also really critical here, remind ourselves of the changing external environment. And we've got the information coming in, information out at the local level and information going in, information going out at the complex adaptive behavior, the kind of emergent structural level. This is really critical because one of the insights we have to take away from everything we've learned about evolu evolutionary biology and, and so on and so forth, is that for an organism to adapt to its environment, it has to be able to process information about its environmental circumstances. And that has to somehow translate into, into, into these biological adaptations. Um, and that's how the evolutionary process has, has kind of succeeded. When that process is working well and information is the information that you're getting is matching your adaptive behavior, then you're able to kind of, you know, evolution is, is happening. But if that doesn't happen, then that, that process of evolution begins to break down. So that's why this idea of information as we're moving forward and thinking about how do we adapt to our current crisis is very, very critical. It's really important for us as a species to have the right information coming in, the right intelligence. And it can't just be raw data. It has to be intelligence because that information has to be something you can use and mobilize into action, into adaptive action. And that's where I, th I think the distinction between just information and intelligence is really crucial because intelligence is, you know, where you have a real insight into an understanding of that, of what's going on so that you can then take the right sort of action. In a way, it's a bit more similar to the idea of wisdom which is more action oriented. It's not just about raw data. So then we kind of come out a little bit. So let's just imagine if we go, so we go back and we think here's a couple of different, this, this, there are lots of different complex adaptive systems which look like this. And we can, we can find them in different, different areas of society. There's individuals with complex adaptive systems and then there are families, there's the workplace, there's communities, there's many different, ways of seeing that complex adaptive systems are all over the place. So really what we're dealing with is a nested overlapping hierarchy of different complex systems. 
And here's one way of seeing how all of that kind of comes together. So you've got the human level interactions of people, families, different groups, and all of that comes together and creates this wider kind of global system. Um, where there, and again, there's this complex interaction between all of them. So really what we're beginning to see is that there's this, we're living in this very big global complex adaptive system, which is made up of these nested complex adaptive systems, but it kind of operates in the same fundamental way. Two other things that are very important to understand is, is, is in, order, in order for us to make sense of all of this complexity, I find it helpful to see that there's not only, yeah, there's this system, there's that system, but we can begin to see that, well, obviously there's, there's the earth system, which is some of the things that are identified at the top here, you know, climate change, there's, you know, there's the, the energy resources, raw materials, minerals, food, oceans, forests, soils, atmosphere, um, I mean, this is a, probably not perfect categorization, but, and at the bottom here, we've got the human system. And I've identified in particular the economy, and we can identify things like growth, production, consumption, trade, and society, hierarchy of needs, well being, population. Of course, these are just some examples of what, 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 is, what comprises an Earth system and the human system. Um, but what's important to understand here is that there is clearly this interaction between the earth system and the human system and what we're going to see is that the way in which these interact allows us to begin to make sense of the risks that we're facing right now here we have an example of an amplifying feedback and it's kind of easy to look at the earth system crisis and less specifically we're looking at a very specific crisis in the climate system called the albedo effect. And this kind of helps us to make sense of what happens when you reach tipping points within these complex adaptive systems. So in this case, you have these different pressures. One is you have global warming and that's human induced and that's led to higher temperatures. And that basically leads the sea ice to melt in the Arctic. And that means that there's less sunlight reflected. And as a result of less sunlight being reflected and there's more open water, then more sunlight is actually absorbed. And that compounds the, uh, the heating process that goes on. As global warming then continues, this process essentially amplifies and becomes a self-reinforcing feedback process. At some point, if this continues, the risk is that we crush we cross a, a threshold into a, into a new phase, um, and it's very very difficult to go back from that. And of course, one of the tipping points in the Arctic is the risk that we lose the summer sea ice. And we're really not sure exactly what will happen when that does happen, if, if that does happen. But we know that it could be a point of no return. Now we know that there are many different tipping points across the climate system, and this is just a, a, a diagram which illustrates very simply the sheer kind of diversity of, of tipping points that we could see taking place within our lifetimes um, you know anything from methane clathrates to the amazon rainforest um, and so on and so forth all of the in all of these complex adaptive systems we see here all of these subsystems they're all at risk of experiencing these amplifying feedbacks which could reach tipping points of no return but of course, that's just looking at the Earth system. And what we've just seen is that there are all sorts of things also happening within human systems. There's just been published a study uh, by Tim Jackson and Craig Wright in Nature Scientific Reports. I think actually just literally a couple of days ago this came out. Uh, in, in a, a, and it's a really interesting study. And what they've done is they've analyzed using um, kind of models and tools that have been used in ocean physics and they've looked, applied them to the economy. Really fascinating work they've done. And what they've shown is that if you compare the nature of recessions uh, over the last um, kind of previous um, early half of the 20th century, going backwards all the way from 1950 onwards, what you can see is a really clear distinction between a period of short and fast recessions, 
And now what we seem to be experiencing is larger and slower recessions. And this graph is very specific to the UK, but they also studied, um, they studied the United States and a couple of other uh, industrialized economies. And I think what's really interesting about this is that it provides, again, another indication when we compare that to the data that we saw previously about some of the trends that we're seeing in the economy and the energy system, that we seem to be approaching this tipping point, that something fundamentally has changed in the way the economic system is operating. So remembering that that previous graph was focused on the UK, this is another graph from Leeds University, a paper published a few years ago, where they tried to understand the, the net ERI, uh, specifically in the UK. And what they found is that net EROI has actually been declining over the last two decades or so. Um, and it in fact peaked in 2000 at a maximum value of about 9.6 and has gone, uh, by 2012, it had fallen to about 6.2 which is very interesting because um, one of the estimates of a minimum EROI that an economy needs for, sus for sustained kind of continued economic growth is about 11, a ratio of about 11 to one, which suggests that the UK economy is currently for, for, for a, a long time been outside of that, that boundary. So how have we sustained economic growth? Well, it suggests that we're doing all sorts of funny things to keep growth going. And one of them, of course, is excessive financialization and debt creation, as previously described. And I'm sure many other things uh, could also be, be looked at. But it's very interesting to see this energy dynamic. And it seems to, again, it gives us a, a grounds to kind of, how does that correlate with the previous graph that we saw where we've seen this large, slow oscillations in, in the nature of recessions? Well, we're beginning to realize that these things have to be connected. Now, the important thing to understand is what happens when these tipping points in these different subsystems begin to happen at the same time. When all of these tipping points begin to accelerate at the same time, this is when we see that the wider emergent structure of the system is beginning to fundamentally change. And our way of understanding that is really simple because these, the rules of the system are made up by what's happening in those subsystems. When all of the subsystems begin to experience these tipping points at the same time, then it means that the rules by which the system operates at a macro level begin to, it begin to be in flux. They begin to be very uncertain and begin to change. That's why, in my view, all of this evidence and data that we're looking at suggests that we are approaching or are really in the midst of an escalating phase transition to a new systemic state. And I think that the, the data for this is really very, very strong. Now there's another framework which you guys probably have heard of, the adapt adaptive cycle framework, which I find really, really useful, uh, created by C.S. Holling, uh, the late ecologist. And he developed this framework from studying the kind of natural ecosystems um, of you know, life cycles of, of you know, of, forests and, and things like that. And he identified four phases in the life cycle of these systems, which we can really usefully apply to understanding the life cycle of human societies and civilizations. And what he said was, there's essentially four stages. The first stage is this period of growth. Over here, it's described as exploitation. So you're kind of re exploiting resources, you're growing, you, you kind of slide up here, and then as you get to the kind of peak of your growth, you enter a stage of conservation where your system begins to stabilize and conserve. And eventually the system reaches a point where it begins to break down and we see this release phase. Um, and then from that release phase and the system kind of breaks down, there's this new space for change and lots of different things can happen because once we come out of the conservation phase, which is a much more stable phase in the release phase is, is we move more into this state where actually the small changes in the system, in the parts of the system can have much wider impacts than they could in the conservation stage. And this paves the ground for the reorganization stage, the fourth and final stage where the system now reorganizes and then we see the foundations for a new life cycle emerging. 
when we apply this um, from a kind of socio-metabolic point of view, this, this is quite useful in seeing where we are as a civilization, because it suggests that we've kind of, you know, we started here around 1492, for example, and we had this exponential growth over the last few centuries. And at some point in time, we went through this conservation stage where we began to stabilize. And we can have a debate about when that happened, but I think that probably happened between 1950 and perhaps 1970 to 1980. Um, and Around that time, we then be had the beginning of the release phase. And I think this probably coincides with the 1970 inflection point that we were seeing, where lots of things start to kick off and lots of, uh, you know, we had this, the, the, the overshoot point kind of began. But then we see lots of destabilization begin to kick in. And it seems to me that we're, you know, as we see 2000, we're now in 2020, and I'm not sure where we are in this release phase, but we're certainly somewhere sliding down moving into closer towards this reorganization point. I don't think we're anywhere near reorganization just yet, which would see the emergence of, um, you know, we begin to see much more clearly the visibility of, of a new life cycle. But I think we've get, we're probably getting there. Um, but this is, this is a really useful way of understanding where we are. And what's really important about this is that while all of the data that we kind of amassed and looked at can when you look at it on its face it seems very alarming and worrying it fills us with anxiety but when we begin to have a wider systems view of what's going on in one way we can actually see that we're on the cusp of this huge opportunity where an old life cycle that once dominated the world is, is essentially coming to an end and as it comes to an end there is this unprecedented opportunity for a new life cycle and as we're moving into this phase, we're seeing more and more evidence that the deeper we go into it, the more opportunities there are for ideas that may have been fringe to suddenly become mainstream. And that's a sword that cuts both ways, obviously, because we've seen that fringe ideas um, on, the, on the kind of extreme right have suddenly become much more mainstream. But we've also seen that fringe ideas like the Green New Deal, which you know, when you were discussing during the conservation stage in the 1970s, you know, 1960s, um, wasn't really taken very seriously. It was seen as a stupid fringe idea, barely solidified at the time. Um, but, you know, we began to discuss it. And now the European Union, for better or worse, they've got a lot, a lot of work to do, where they've officially adopted the idea of the Green New Deal as, as, a, as a policy. And that, I think, is an example um, of the kind of scope there is for quite big impacts. And of course, we have a long way to go and, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but there's, there's a lot of grounds for hope. But that doesn't mean that we should be sanguine. And this is a framework that I've developed, the esd HSD framework, which I which kind of I hinted at in one of the previous slides, um, which I talk about in my book, Failing States, Collapsing Systems. Um, and this indicates what can happen to the old system when you're sliding down that release stage, this interaction between earth system disruption and human system destabilization. And I think what's happening here is that we're seeing a large scale amplifying feedback loop developing where we have an earth system disruption generating a shock, which triggers a crisis. This then leads to a systemic breakdown. Um, and that systemic breakdown can often lead to otherization. And the reason it might lead to otherization is because whole systems intelligence isn't present within the actors in the system. Instead, we have these very old fragmented ways of seeing things and doing things based on the old system. And that leads to blaming symptoms often. So instead of understanding, for example, in Syria, that really there's a big problem here that we need to deal with, Bashar al-Assad just responds by shooting at protesters because that's what he sees on the street and that's what's bothering him same thing with migrants turning up on the borders of europe rather than seeing the wider earth system crisis at stake and the bigger issues many of us are only seeing that these these these, these foreigners turning up and and destabilizing uh, um, the systems that we have in place and so we respond to that to try and stabilize it so we can begin to see that a lot of the reason there are these very narrow, symptom-oriented and otherizing responses because of the lack 
of a systemic holistic approach from the outset. Um, and that can often then trigger these forms of conflict, which we've described, and that leads to human system destabilization. And as the human system destabilizes, of course, then what happens is we're much weaker. Our institutions are ill-equipped to deal with the next crisis. We, we are preoccupied with responding to the war on terror, for example. We're preoccupied with responding to nationalism or responding to, to migrants or responding to some other, you know, you name it, whatever your bugbear is. That's what we're, we're worried about. We're preoccupied. And as a result, the next shock um, hits us at point one because we're already very vulnerable and the ne next earth system disruption hits and it triggers another crisis. Now, if we take this framework and apply it back to the processes that we've just been describing, we can see that we're, we're, we're moving through this process at the moment. With the 2008 financial crash, for example, as an example of one of the earth system disruptions that we faced. And then we can see the, you know, with the kind of the peak of, the peak of global conventional oil production, for example, as one major driver of that, not the only one, but one major one, interacting with the, the, the housing crisis and the debt bubble that had built up. All of that was playing out. We had the 2011 Arab Spring, which, which occurred just a few years later. Um, and of course, we had, that had its ramifying impacts, but it also came in the context of these other Earth system crises we discussed, the case of Syria, for example. And moving forward, we keep going and we end up with 2000, in 2020. I'm sure there were other things going on in between at that time with the Eurozone crisis and so on and so forth. But 2020, though, I think is interesting because we can really see how the pandemic has emerged as another huge Earth system disruption. We were not ready to answer. We didn't, most people didn't anticipate it. I know I certainly didn't. Um, I mean, I think some, some of us may have been talking about the risk of pandemics. Um, in a general sense, but would it happen in 2020? I don't think anybody predicted that um, in that way. Um, and it's led to all of these breakdowns. And the risk, of course, is that we continue on this kind of breakdown cycle without um, taking the right adaptive action. But what's really also important to see here is that as we slide down this cycle, which is one way of sliding down the release phase, we have to remember that at each stage, the system, each stage of systemic breakdown is also a weakening of that system. And at each stage of that weakening, there are new opportunities for action and new opportunities to lay down the next life cycle for system change. So at each point in this process, there is an opportunity for intervention, an opportunity for action. And that opportunity opens up further and further and further in different ways. So that's also the other important thing to remember. Another framework, that I'll, this is the last framework that I'm going to mention that's in, an important one is uh, Thomas Homer Dixon's concept of synchronous failure, um, which is extremely useful for understanding why and how different crises within specific sectors can end up overloading the system and leading to what he calls synchronous failure. And this helps us to understand why these things can happen so rapidly. And this diagram, which he's put together it's pretty useful in understanding that we begin with all of these multiple simultaneous stresses. And we've already had a big survey of, of many of those stresses across the energy, climate, social sectors, and so on and so forth. And these can then overload different elements of the system. So we have, look, overload of system one, overload of system two. And the problem is, of course, is that these systems are not disconnected. They're fundamentally interconnected, which means that when we have a systemic crisis, in these two different sectors or multiple sectors, we have a multi-systemic crisis. And this can then create a cascading series of effects. So this is exactly what is happening right now with the COVID-19 crisis. And I think we can confidently say that our governments and our institutions are deeply ill-equipped to understand the crisis, to, to prepare for what is likely to happen in the next few months and years. Um, and one of the big reasons for that as well is to do with the wider symptom of all of this, which is the kind of the failure of our sense-making process. And this brings us back to this keystone idea of intelligence. And this diagram that I've got here is something produced by um, a colleague of mine from the, oh, I've forgotten his name. Um, I will try to remember his name 
uh, towards the end of the tour, but basically he, he's a cognitive scientist and he produced um, this wonderful graph a couple of years ago where he was mapping out, so not a graph, it's a, ma it's a ma network map, where he mapped out conversations going on, going on in 2016. And he sh basically showed that there were these hubs of conversation that were going on. And even though there were some overlaps, but unfortunately they coalesced around specific issues in such a way that they became really isolated from each other. And rather than social media enabling a really kind of productive cross fertilization of perspectives and ideas, instead what we've had is an extreme polarization. And what we're experiencing now, what many of you, many of you probably also experienced is this sense of acceleration in the flows of information, a sense of polarization in the flows of information, a sense of being unable to keep up with the sheer volume of facts and information across these different sectors as the crises accelerate. And as a result, an increasing inability within, our, within, within these kind of media systems to really make sense of how these things fit together and what's going on. Instead, we have fostered this growing sense of confusion and anxiety. So as we're moving more into this release phase, what's happening is our existing sense-making apparatus is also kind of breaking down and it's losing its, its coherence. And this is also a really big symptom of the phase shift. As you remember that one of the critical components of, of, of an adaptive complex adaptive system is the role of information coming into a system and coming out and that role in enabling us to adapt and what's clearly happening at this point is as, as we're as we're breaching these planetary boundaries as the system is kind of scaling through that that post process it's moving into this period of uncertainty and breakdown and we're seeing and we're experiencing that in our information systems so finally as we're, i'm going to try and get towards a more solution focused approach now. When we take this idea of a face shift, it actually can become really empowering in allowing us to see what comes next. The first thing we see is that we are in the throes of a crisis threshold and the system is now at a point where it can either regress or evolve. And perhaps to be more specific, I think what we need to say is that there, there is an old system or, or an old set of systems that very much is going to basically collapse in different ways. Um, that, so, you know, there are parts of that system which may, which may be adapted. Um, there are new systems which may be put in place, but there's absolutely no doubt that there are key parts of this old system which cannot survive and should not survive. And we have to let go. And that's going to be, you know, that's going to be a difficult process for us to kind of process that we have to, we may find ourselves experiencing a lot of grief. We may find ourselves really waking up to this and kind of feeling a sense of shock at how, how we have to face up to all of this kind of, in a way needing to kind of move past, we have to move past it. But we also have to realize and kind of sit with this idea that we, we face this unprecedented historic moment. It's a really truly unique opportunity for our species and, uh, for our history because we've never faced an opportunity like this before on a global scale and each of us has this role to play as disruptors of the old paradigm and as agents of, of regeneration that can usher in a truly new adaptive response we have to now orient ourselves towards this new life cycle and so we have to we have to kind of embrace this idea of this opportunity for breakthrough change that we now see emerging as we're kind of moving down through this release phase. And we have to ask ourselves, what does an adaptive response look like? How do we get prepared for the next life cycle? A couple of really simple thoughts that um, four kind of basic things that we begin to see as we're moving through the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, that are absolutely inescapable, I think, is one, we're facing a period of crashing GDP and it looks like we may not escape a period of crashing GDP. The question we need to ask ourselves is how can we orient human activity to flourish in a, in, during a time of plummeting GDP? Is it possible? That's one thing we need to ask ourselves. The other thing that we want to ask ourselves, I think, is what are the values that motivate us? What are the values that, that we want to orient our lives by? If, if the old way of seeing things and doing things, this idea of kind of self-maximization, kind of continued material accumulation, if that's, not, if that's not the thing that's gonna do it, 
what is the value system that makes more sense that's based on interconnection between human species and the planet it's another thing i think we need to ask ourselves the two other things i think that come are, are very practical which is we know that there are huge risks to our food and manufacturing systems and our supply chains which are only going to accelerate how do we toughen these supply chains so they become more resilient how do we transform them uh, if if toughening them is not going to work how do we change them so that they work how do we localize them so that they're more meaningful for people in local communities so that they're not just redundant like so many of our supply chains in this crisis have shown that they're not resilient because they're so far flung across vast distances and they just they just don't have redundancy what about building more resilient supply chains more localized supply chains how do we do that and the other thing I think that comes up is this idea of community and coordination uh, and realizing that one of the things I think that's clearly that the highlights of the pandemic is, is, is clearly the human spirit for cooperation, for love, for compassion, for generosity, which even, even in the midst of some of the most horrendous things going on, that, that overwhelming spirit, I think, is what's really got people through a really difficult time is the willingness of people from all walks of life and all sectors to say, I'm going to lay down what I was doing before. I'm going to try something new and try something different. I'm going to work together with the people around me. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we scale that up? How do we move forward? And when we, when we take all of that learning that we've done about the structural problems related to the crisis that we face, I think that we can identify a whole suite of sectors and areas for what a life oriented system looks like and even though i think there's lots of contestation here lots of healthy debate and discussion that we need to have around this i think orienting ourselves in this way is critical because we need to be able to really center ourselves around a vision and it's going to be um, a fluid vision in fact it will be it will be multiple visions um, but we need to orient ourselves around what does a life oriented system look like? How do we move from a system which valued um, GDP and money and, and other kind of machine like things into what values life and the conditions that enable life to thrive? That really needs to be our focus. And we can see that there are a number of these things which many experts across different disciplines have identified. In terms of energy, we're recognizing that of course we need to shift away from fossil fuels as much as we possibly can and generally what that looks like i think most of the research is indicating that that looks like more decentralized infrastructure one where local households and businesses are operating as not just consumers of this energy but as producers of this energy rather than it kind of being owned and controlled by giant conglomerates and there may be some cases where where kind of more centralized own ownership might make some sense for example if we're trying to talk about places where the sun has much more uh, it's much easier to get access to the sun in a desert location for example and there may be some space to say well you know that we need to have a different kind of approach there but i think generally the ideal scenario we're looking at even if we're looking at even you know that kind of things we're looking at an integrated approach and that leads us to the idea of electricity and the idea of smart microgrids that can transform, transform urban infrastructure. And we're looking at this emergence of a sharing economy when it comes to electricity. And I think people like Jeremy Rifkin have done some really interesting work around um, this idea of harnessing uh, big data in a positive way, rather than using big data for surveillance. We use data technologies to accelerate our ability to share uh, energy across vast distances and in our communities so that it's not this centralized process controlled by a few but it's something where there's lots of empowerment and that of course comes part and parcel with transforming our supply chains because if we're going to shift to this kind of a system then we need to ask ourselves how do we make it sustainable how do we make renewable energy sustainable we don't want to keep relying for example on one particular um, set of countries like China, for example, where people have identified, of course, lots of critical raw materials we use in renewables come from places like China. We need to, to think about different approaches. And one of those different, one of the new areas of research is the idea of using circular economy principles to recycle 
critical raw materials so that we can increasingly localize manufacturing and again reduce our dependence on far flung and expensive supply chains. That of course allows us to think more, more widely about opportunities for jobs. So ra rather than us having this fixed idea of, you know, there is the big uh, capitalist owner of production and there's the wage laborers, there's a slightly more space for, for, for equalization here where consumers are also producers of food, water, and technology. And we can imagine, for example, what, what, what's gonna happen when, when 3D printing kind of scales up. And we're already seeing during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, entrepreneurial groups of people coming together and saying, we're gonna start printing, 3D printing um, face masks, or not face masks, but you know, those plastic shields and all sorts of different tools and things like that. Um, as collectives of people coming together to kind of come up with hacks for how to manufacture at a local level um, ventilators, for example. So what we're seeing is this shift towards more people becoming empowered in these processes of production. Um, so we want to know how we can scale that. The other, of course, really important thing is money. How do we basically create new debt-free forms of exchange and lending to move ourselves off this existing debt system? And I think this is a really crucial thing. And there is also there's some really important work being done in the monetary reform movement by organizations like Positive Money, uh, who have shown that it's perfectly possible to have a public banking approach rather than a private banking approach where you don't create debt money, where the government uh, creates money rather than borrowing money. And the structures are done in such a way that it avoids the creation of excessive amounts of debt um, and this can be really, really a powerful way of creating new forms of funding, which are sustainable, which can then be invested in all of these things that we've just spoken about. And of course, that has to come part and parcel with new ways of thinking about how we structure our companies and organizations. Is it really necessary to, to keep the for-profit model? Um, and is there a way of making, even if we do have that kind of model, to make it actually work so that Profits is not the only thing that matters. And maybe that means changing entirely the way companies operate. Some people are talking about, like Jennifer Hinton, for example, has spoken about the nonprofit economic models um, being really, really powerful and you know, actually really entrepreneurial. Um, but I think generally we're looking at this idea of making these enterprises more cooperative so that, again, the ownership structures are, are not so deeply unequal but that, that division between labor and capital becomes much more sensible may, may, if that there could be shared ownership structures more cooperative ownership structures but there's lots of lots of things out there many of them shown to work which could be really effective of course that leads us also to think about property differently or can we think about different arrangements for communal stewardship and all of this of course allows us to think more radically about politics and as we're seeing the growing disillusionment, disillusionment with, with existing political systems, I think what we want to do is think about how we can empower communities to create governance structures that work for them. And that means both working to continue to reform existing political structures within our democratic institutions and making them much more participatory and less susceptible to corruption. But it also means thinking outside the box um, and thinking about doing things differently. And what's interesting again, is people were talking about e-voting, for example, bef you know, long before the pandemic, but now with the pandemic and the pressures that it's brought, e-voting and doing things electronically suddenly become something on the agenda, something that's often e perhaps even necessary. Um, and can it be made more efficient? Can it be made, can it be done in a way which is protective of data um, and protective of people's privacy? Um, and so on and so forth. There's all sorts of things to think about. But I think, again, we're moving into this space where these opportunities to really discuss a radically different type of politics which empowers communities at the grassroots. The idea of citizens' assemblies, for example, that was innovated by, um, really being spoken about by Extinction Rebellion, um, is, is again, it's, it's an example of, of one of these models that could be used and scaled up in different ways. All of that, of course, comes with a cultural shift. And I think the three biggest components of the cultural shift are media education and ethics. And for media, it comes down to 
recognizing that we really, you know, the media as, as it stands today has really failed us. It doesn't operate as a sense-making apparatus. It operates as a confusion-making apparatus that is beholden to various vested interests, you know, whoever they are, whether it's the business model of the media company uh, or it's, uh, you know, a kind of slightly more parochial and worrying model of, of other special interests like the fossil fuel industry or the defense industries and so on and so forth. So we need to think about how we can create new architectures by which we can communicate with each other and share and scale systems awareness and action. That of course has to come with education. How do we bring this sort of understanding of, of life and the new life cycle into our educational systems, into vocations, into skills training, so that we can begin this, this stops being just a, a kind of an academic thing, but be, um, becomes a more practical thing. And we're br bringing together academics and pr practitioners into a whole new paradigm. And again, it's something which we've seen the challenges faced by universities during the pandemic. And many of them are wondering, you know, what's the point of a lot of the disciplines that we have at the moment? Are, are they really working? Are they necessary? Are they relevant? I think universities, have a lot of thinking to do about what's the next step to, steps are for, for, for how they, what are the courses which are relevant. And I think we've only just begun this process and it will begin to accelerate in the next few years. Finally, the idea of ethics. I think it's, be, it's time to realize that our previous understanding of life where we view ourselves as fundamentally disconnected from each other, um, basically doesn't really work and doesn't have a proper evolutionary place and that actually acting with love and compassion and caring for each other these are objectively adaptive behaviors and this can open up all sorts of grounds for discussion and and, and exploration of what that means for us as as human beings which i think is an exciting time to be in to be able for us to have those kinds of discussions but more importantly it needs to underpin a real paradigm shift in how we see ourselves and how we see our place in the world. Finally, I'm going to close with four more slides about how do we actually take these ideas and thoughts, which are quite big, and actually do something with them in, in terms of actually kind of moving into a space of system change. And I know this is something that I've struggled with for many years and kind of, I've, sat down for a while and tried to think you know how did it work for me um, and, the, and the people that I see around me who are doing some really amazing work what was it that they did so this is what I've kind of come up with and it's it's really open to it's quite it's quite a preliminary and I'd love to get a sense of what people think about it I think there's four stages stage one is recognizing that all of this really has a direct impact on us as, as individuals it's, it's, it's it means we need to we need to think about this as a living practice. Systems theory and systems thinking isn't really just, you know, it shouldn't be just an academic discussion. It shouldn't just be about flowcharts and models. It has to really be about how we see and think in our lives. And that means once we've, once we've gone through that kind of process of doing that research and kind of waking up, realizing what's going on, we need to kind of go on a new path as individuals where we think, see, and act for a new life cycle. And that means really consciously and intentionally incorporating these new values, evaluating our relationships, whether they are in our family or in our workplace or um, you know, in our wider context, seeing you know, how that all works and how that fits with the, with the kind of new kind of realizations that we've had, assessing what we're really aligned with in that context Assessing our capabilities as individuals. What are we good at? What do we bring to the table? And I think most importantly, it's making new commitments and looking at the old commitments that we may have made and really evaluating them to see, are these really planet level commitments? Are they really committed to, the, to, to what extent am I really committed to this new life cycle that I find myself facing this historic, unprecedented opportunity? What's my what's my way forward really um so that's all about i think it's about upgrading ourselves and it really does start with us it starts with us kind of embracing and recognizing that change begins right here right now 
with me. Stage two, I think, is then when we begin to scale that to some extent in our wider context. And I've called this contextualized whole of intelligence. So that, I think that's when we begin, we begin to kind of apply that pathway a bit. And that f the first step I, I've outlined is building whole systems intelligence. And I think that means when you begin to kind of live this practice of thinking and seeing things systemically, you know, starting to practice across disciplines in a way in your thinking, but also in your life, actively trying to align your values with the planet. And then assessing your skill, go, go, moving for building on that capability assessment that we spoke about, we more specifically assess, you know, what's, what are my skills? What are my existing resources and what is my context? Uh, what's the context in which I'm operating in? How within that context can I mobilize my skills and resources to begin to expand my field of networked intelligence? So as an individual, I'm able to then see who can I bring in to this kind of understanding of whole system intelligence that I'm developing, my co-travelers in a way who I can work with and bond with and, and go along this journey with, because I can't do this alone. I have to do it with other people within my context. And then once you've, once you've kind of got together and you kind of expanded that field and you have a group of people, you can work together to help each other in building that whole systems intelligence amongst ourselves amongst ourselves you know whether that's education you know whether it's you know training each other up whether it's pointing things out in our lifestyles but you know working together to do that to, to do that same process of assessment together and that can then underpin how we can develop new strategies for life oriented action and by that i mean action which in a sense consciously breaks with the old paradigm and is intentionally oriented towards a new paradigm, a new, a new life cycle. So we say acting for new life cycle ideas, beliefs and, and values. And, I, and also, of course, thinking more concretely about how we can act for new life cycle structures and processes. And that, of course, will mean different things for different people in different contexts. If you're a writer, it may have a certain implication. If, you're, um, if, you're, if you work in a company, it will have a different implication. If you work in the food sector, again, a different implication. Um, and for some people, it will have all sorts of, it will have, some people may find themselves with access to very powerful systems. Other people may find themselves that they're, that, you know, if they feel that they're, they're a cog in the machine, they have less uh, arena of action in their workplace, but they may find they have more arenas of action in their family or in their community. So it really does depend. Um, but it's something that each of us can only do individually. The stage three point, uh, well, I say individually, but obviously I, the emphasis is to bring other people into that process. So you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with a group. And I think the stage three is also critical, which is, you know, we come back to this, this graph we saw before, identifying leverage points. And I think this comes back to something that uh, Donella Meadows uh, pointed out, which is that it's really important also to kind of try and target leverage points within a system. And that, again, will mean different things for different people people and to some extent i think all of us together do have to think about what are the critical leverage points within the system and on a big scale and of course that means looking at the oil and gas industry it means looking at people in the financial sector and so on and so forth but it also means looking at how we as individuals might connect up with those sectors uh, in, in and some of us may and some of us may not but it also means that we may look at how we connect up with different types of leverage points what are the leverage points closest to us within our own context we may find that there are there's no point acting on leverage points where we have no reach as an individual focus on the leverage points where we do have reach as an individual and that may well be things that you can do locally and in your community and that's really important because don't it's not we shouldn't neglect those in fact that's where the most powerful action can often be done but that doesn't mean we neglect areas of action where we can't reach because what we may find is that there are people who are reaching those leverage points which are very powerful like for example the financial sector and doing some work but they they need help from people who don't have direct access they need you know the xr movements and, and you know the, the sunrise movements they need other big grassroots movements to be creating that groundswell of pressure so there's always a space for that type of activity where you find you combine those types of work where there's grassroots pressure from below 
and there's more directed pressure from people connected who have more lev more direct access to those leverage points and when they work together that's when you can see that we'll be able we're able to insert ourselves into those spaces to have achieved this clear goal of seeding whole systems intelligence within those spaces to inform new directions of strategic action. And I think the key, the key kind of awakening point for me when I was thinking about system change is that we're not going to change systems until key sectors and areas across these different systems, we see, we see people in those systems actually waking up to a whole systems approach. Until that happens, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to begin to get to that point where we see the system itself beginning to change. And so we need to find a way to scale that process in different ways. And that leads me, I guess, to the fourth stage. And this is really helpful because this, as you can see, these, these diagrams I've borrowed from what um, people are talking about what happens with the COVID-19 pandemic. But they're actually quite interesting because viral dynamics provide us a really interesting insight into how as individuals, we have a lot of power. We can scale the replication of health systems intelligence by recognizing that really it's almost like a, it's almost like we are we have to recognize that we are nodes in the system and once we have upgraded ourselves to that level of wholesome intelligence for example the idea is that you want to seed it and create it within your context and your within that field of networked intelligence and then you're moving it further and further until it's spreading out and scaling elsewhere and that of course is what um other experts social tipping point experts for example will say you know they talk about when you have uh, what, what are the critical what's the critical mass that you need to, to kind of scale behavior change and they try to map that out but i think what's really important is for each of us as individuals and in our organizational context to realize that actually there's a pretty clear set of processes that we can follow to begin to make this a much more coherent and coordinated process and what we need to do is really scale that so that each of us more of us are kind of acting in a way like um like a virus you take on you know you take on that dynamic within your you put that in, into the cell and then it keeps spreading and keeps spreading and keeps spreading and keeps self-replicating what we're trying to do is exactly that is find ways to replicate a new way of seeing the world and acting in the world at wider and wider scales and hopefully if we do that we will begin to get to a point where we can see uh, a new life cycle and we can see ourselves playing into that so i've come to the close of my talk and I just want to remind us of the five-step process that we've described. We've discussed quite a lot of different things. So we realize that COVID-19 is a symptom of an ecological crisis related to the structure of our civilization. We've realized that we previously were very fragmented in our understanding of this, and that's what's kind of prevented us from really responding to it. But when we've taken a more whole systems approach, we can really see that actually what's happening is is a much bigger process it's a world historic systemic process where this civilization has entered or is nearing the last stage of its life cycle certainly the second half i would say and the current pandemic has accelerated that and what that means is the old system is breaking down but it also means that we have this amazing new opportunity to think forward towards the new new life cycle and that's what i hope together we can we can focus on thank you very much